uh, I guess on Lynn Mallard's live. Good. Um, okay, today's, today's evening, just to repeat, I guess I missed the start of the broadcast. Um, today's topic will be the motion component, which is the uh, health component which links the CNC stack. So everything that generates movement in, uh, in the CNC stack uh, um, to the HAL pins. Uh, I'm just hearing in the feedback channel that there is no sound. Everybody no sound. Yes, I'm hearing my health self quite well. Um, okay, so it seems to be, the sound seems to be going out. Um, seems to be a single a localized problem. Anyway, uh, so the, the topic of um, uh, today is the, the motion component. Um, I've tried to keep it a little bit shorter than the last time because uh, I tended to cover too much. So give me, let me give a, a, a short uh, overview of what I'm going to talk about and also what I'm not going to talk about this evening. Um, let me... Uh, uh, Bring in the slides, screen share. Uh, okay, I think this is it. Present to everyone. Fine. Good. Um, so, what we're going to talk about this evening is uh, you need to understand the key functions of the motion component. We'll just not be able to explore every detail, detail in there. It is huge and it is all, only come uh, clear to become clear to me while preparing this talk to cover uh, all the corners and all the features of motion would take at least four or five of these one hour talks. So that's not realistic. Uh, we need to uh, chop that up. Um, and some, some, some of the parts are frankly not, not that important or interesting. So today we'll focus on the, on the, on the big picture, on the overview and how modes and operations and, and flows fit together. Uh, we will skip a lot. I'll, I'm going to address that uh, later on. Uh, to understand uh, everything, we need to first establish a bit of common terminology. Uh, some of that seems clear. Well, uh, frankly, uh, the EMC project was caught in a decade, at least uh, in the yeah, mixing up the, the terms joints and axes. So uh, that's certainly warranted. Um, also to understand motion, we need to discuss modes because that motion modes, that is a pervasive concept um, and uh, uh, determines its behavior very much. Uh, we'll look into um, how the information flows from the CNC stack to motion to hell in the two key modes in the coordinated mode and in the joint mode, uh, which is for jogging and the like. Um, then we turn a little bit to the APIs, or non-APIs, if you will, because uh, um, there is not much for public consumption in terms of API in the motion component. Um, but we'll, uh, except for task, that is, so we'll look on how task interfaces to this beast and um, how the status is reported back. And then we'll look at a few of the key APIs within Motion uh, on key components, focusing mostly on the coordinated mode because, in, in my view, that's a more interesting and more, a more important one. Um, the, the trajectory planner and its API and what it does. Um, what kinematics are about, um, how the results of the trajectory planner are, are actually played out to hell. Uh, so uh, from there, motors and joints actually move. Uh, we'll look at a dark corner called the, the cubic interpolator. Uh, <clears throat> we'll briefly touch about uh, homing and how that is done. And we'll summarize a little bit what we can do with it if you were not perfectly happy with uh, what what motion offers. 
Uh, let me be frank, there's no, there's a lot of topics we cannot cover today. Uh, I will not be able to give you the basics of trajectory planning, like how you ramp up velocities and how you do look ahead, how you do past planning, that kind of thing. Uh, is too detailed in the first run. Uh, I hope to uh, will have Rob Ellenberg tune in on that particular topic uh, with a SQL talk. Um, we also will not be covering spindle operations. Motion does uh, operate a spindle, the, uh, uh, for which is typical for a mill or a lathe. Uh, other uh, uh, configurations like 3D printers or so don't, do not typically support it a spindle. Um, there is um, one very distinguishing functionality in motion called a, a spindle synchronized moves. Uh, we'll not be able to cover that. That is very deep down in the trajectory planner in hell. Uh, and it's too, too detailed for a first go and first pass over the whole, whole theme. Um, and um, if you have a cheap machine, then you have backlash on the screws. Uh, and uh, there is some provision in, in motion to correct for backlash and to do screw compensation. Um, uh, it is implemented. I personally have never used it. And I would be out of my depth on uh, uh, telling you a lot about it. So uh, that's a topic which I'll skimp uh, for today as well. So that's it. We'll stay with a high-level overview of the, the coordinated and joint modes and see on how things fit together there and defer from then on, because we'll easily exceed our, our, our limit. Anyway, uh, let's do a bit of terminology first. Um, uh, the tool tip, you'll see that in the, in the documentation uh, a bit, also under the term controlled point. Um, that is what we are moving with uh, everything trajectory. Um, the robotics folks call that the, the position of the end effector. But it's the same thing. It's the tooltip. And that is what trajectory planning uh, is all about. It's about moving the tooltip. Uh, now, let's distinguish axes and joints. Um, um, Axis is a term in Cartesian space, in x, y, z. Uh, so it's a degree of freedom uh, where uh, the tooltip may move. Whereas a joint, uh, or simplified, a motor, a li uh, is something which can be moved. Now, in trivial configurations like a mill, you actually have a coincidence of the concept of joint and axis. Because if a mill joint moves, that's the x joint, that's the y joint, that's the z joint, those move and those happen to be axes. That is called a trivial kinematics. Uh, in, uh, and in that case, uh, a joint equals an axis. There's actually a flag in the code, if you look at the kinematics code, called kinematics identity to, to mark that special case that axes and joints are identical. In the general case, in robotics, robot arms, pumas, scaras, um, that is not the case. Um, so you need to do have a mapping between an axis value, which is, um, or, a, or a pose, which is moving in, in Cartesian space, and the actual position of the joint. Uh, and that particular mapping is called kinematics. Uh, it is a mapping between axis and joint movements. Uh, it is specific for a particular configuration. Uh, for a, uh, it is influenced by the geometry and the setup of the uh, of the machine. Uh, it is a linear uh, or um, uh, linear uh, transformation only in the trivial case. Um, if you think of a Puma or, Ro uh, or Scara robot arm, then you'll see that the, the um, relation is not at all linear, especially as uh, a joint moves to the maximum angle, um, where uh, incremental movements become very, very minuscule. So, uh, kinematics is a key concept. It's, it is specific for a particular setup. It maps between axis and joint movements. Uh, and um, since we have, we our planning, 
our G code interpreter works in in axis space, in Cartesian space, whereas the machine, uh, in the general case, works in some joint space. So we need the transformation as we go from from the past mode, from the from the Cartesian space towards the machine, because when we drive the machine, we can actually only drive joints. We have a discrete motor, uh, which might not have to do anything with a uh, uh, with an axis directly. Um, so uh, we need a transformation from axis to joints uh, to to compute joint positions given what the interpreter tells us in in axis space in Cartesian space, and in the reporting pass back from the hardware from the helpings where the motors actually are, we need the, the inverse transformation um, uh, the, uh, which transforms joint positions to axis positions. Now, um, transforming axis to joints is called the inverse kinematics and joints to uh, translating joint values to axis is called the forward kinematics. So you, you want, that is a very fundamental concept and you want to memorize that one. Um, also, a term uh, which is related to the tooltip or end effector position or, uh, or current point um, is the, the term pose. That is a Cartesian position of the tooltip, uh, and it might involve more than three dimensions. If you think of a multi axis arm, um, it typically entails the tooltip position and the tool orientation. So six axis or two 3D vectors would be uh, your, your starting point here. Uh, that is mirrored in a data structure, in a struct which you find in a, in a machine kit code base. And it, that is a very fundamental structure called the EMC pose. Um, and you see on the field definitions on how that pose has evolved from a trivial kinematics three axis machine to more complex, com complex co configurations. It has a lot of it, um, a lot of legacy in it. Um, a tool is really just a vector addition to the tool, the, to the um, to the controlled point, uh, and it is specific for a particular tool. Some machines use tools, some don't, so that's an optional part, but it needs to be handled in motion as well. So that's where tool offsets come in. But conceptually, a tool offset is a, a, a EMC pose value. Now, going back to the interpreter, uh, what uh, the interpreter generates, and we did cover that uh, with the interpreter talk, that is in Cartesian space, and it's a polyline. So it's a continuous sequence of lines and arcs, really, or uh, lines, arcs, and nerves, uh, uh, depending on which constructs you use. Uh, plus, it has a desired timing associated with it, which you in G code express uh, with the concept of feed. Uh, so the pass is a um, a, uh, a Cartesian concept. Now, talking about trajectory planning, you you probably heard that term before. So, what uh, a Cartesian pass is a uh, a continuous concept. Now we have a digital system here, a sampling system which plays out uh, samples maybe a uh, thousand a second. So that Cartesian pass has to be hashed up into a sequence of control points in equidistant in time. Uh, and these points are along the pass. So, and by the way, while you're doing it, you need to ob observe some, obey certain constraints. Uh, you could uh, maybe, uh, set a feed of 1,000 in the interpreter, but then it turns out that the hardware actually cannot, the joints cannot move faster than maybe 30 or so. And um, the trajectory planning is where these limitations, these constraints are applied. There's a, a whole range of uh, constraints which could be applied. Um, the machine key planner only uh, applies uh, a very few ones. Uh, it's pass continuity, smoothness, the maximum velocity, uh, the maximum acceleration of a machine, 
uh, the maximum jerk, what happens if the, the toolpath changes direction. Uh, as a fundamental concept, it's important to distinguish that trajectory planning can happen either uh, on, at the joint level, so at uh, whatever drives the motors, or at the axis in the Cartesian space. Okay? Uh, both configurations are possible, both have uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages. To understand what motion does is motion plans in axis space. The trajectory planner in motion works in the Cartesian space. Uh, and in fact, it doesn't have a clue if actually a, a kinematics transform is added later downstream. So um, the, the planner in, uh, in, in machine kit works on, uh, in, in Cartesian in space, and it even doesn't know um, um, that there, there is a, any, any kinematics transform tagged onto it. Now, in terms, if, if, if you look at a specific machine, um, what is limited here? Well, it is the joint, it's the actual motor. A motor can only go so fast, it can only accelerate so fast. So the limitations uh, which need to be applied to a pass to arrive at an executable trajectory, trajectory which does not exceed the limits of the hardware, uh, those limitations are typically in joint space. Okay? They are not in the Cartesian space, but they are related to a specific motor, um, uh, a specific joint. Now, um, thanks to the legacy which we have in, uh, in, the, in the machine key planner, um, and the fact that it started out as a trivial kinematics planner, all the limitations were applied in axis space, but not in joint space. Uh, and so motion really understands only axis limits, not joint limits. Uh, so if you look at the configuration, you'll find uh, axis, underscore, and a serial number, and you find some values like uh, position limits, uh, velocity limits, acceleration limits. Those really are meant to be in Cartesian space, and um, the, uh, the planner actually doesn't know um, um, uh, that uh, a joint is involved. Uh, now, um, so that is the concept of trajectory planning. Can be in joint space, can be in, in axis space. The one we use works in Cartesian space. Everything else, come translation um, uh, to joint space uh, is further down the pipeline. Uh, now, uh, what we find if we study the code in motion is a concept called interpolation. Um, uh, interpolation uh, is something you do when you, uh, you have a coarse set of samples and you try to smooth a pass between them. Um, that uh, such an interpolator uh, uh, code piece is present in motion, we'll come on later to it. It's usually intended to smooth the motion. Uh, it's actually dysfunctional in the current motion component for, for uh, reasons which we'll find out later once we get there. Um, the last, thing, uh, last two concepts, um, you might be familiar with them just to make sure why we discuss them in a motion context. Homing is about associating a, a particular joint position with a particular uh, position pin in hell, uh, with a, a value in hell. Um, just think about a startup of the machine and uh, your machine or robot arm does not have absolute encoders. Only the more expensive configurations actually have that. Uh, in many cases, you either do not have an encoder at all, which would be typical for stepper configurations, or you have, uh, with a servo, in many cases, you just have a relative encoder, um, which you, once you turn it on, it starts off at zero, but it doesn't know where within the range of possible joint positions it actually starts out. Uh, now, 
that is a problem which is typical for low-end configurations, which we, uh, which we, we cheapskates have to deal with. Um, in industrial motion control, you find uh, drives which typically record and remember their positions, even in a, under a power failure condition or under e-stop conditions, uh, and homing is barely ever done. That is a typical phenomenon of low-end configurations like we have them. Um, so if the machine starts up, uh, you need to associate where is my position uh, of the machine relative to what Hal believes it does, and the homing run, uh, which typically involves touching switches, um, does establish that position. Jogging, everybody used it. It's really just about moving joints. Uh, that is the more prevalent method. Um, in theory, we could move a joint, which move, would move just a single motor, or we could move in several dimensions uh, or in Cartesian space, which might or might not, depending on kinematics, involve one or several uh, motors in the machine. So jogging maybe uh, is about manual movement. It may uh, mean one or several joints or one or several axes moved together in, in coordinate. Um, in robotic space, you have uh, typically something like teach-in procedures, which are basically a, a way to generate a path from leading a, uh, a machine around and recording that path and have it play out. So that's, if, if you will, uh, a form of jogging or, or coordinated or axis mode jogging, uh, which is uh, driven by a sensor like a um, like a three-dimensional mouse or, or a joystick. OK, so that roughly covers the terminology we need to know. Uh, to discuss motion, uh, we, if you look at the page, we discussed this distinguishing between joints and axes quite a bit already. Now, uh, if we turn the page and discuss motion modes, we'll see that has a, a correspondence in primary operating modes of the motion component. Yeah? That's very important to understand because depending on the mode the motion component that it is, is in, very different things happen. I mean, very. Uh, um, as a high-level overview, we have four modes. Really, two are important. The off mode, which we're not really cared about. That's once we're e-stopped or the machine has just been powered on. The motors are disabled. It's a safety mode, if you will. The key modes we, which we are interested in for, for this hour is joint mode, which we discussed, So, or it's also called free mode, free, free planning mode. Um, that is about moving joints, uh, which, as it is implemented in a motion component, only one joint can be operated at, at a single most time. Uh, that's a very somewhat restricted form of coding. There's nothing which would uh, uh, would not enable, would, wouldn't make it possible to move several joints at once. It's just a poor choice of data structures. So, uh, but it, the way it's implemented, it's uh, typically used for uh, UI-driven jogging. So start jogging or start jogging for a certain distance, uh, which is typically an axis distance, uh, a joint distance. And uh, if you release the jog, if you do a continuous jog, then releasing the, the jog button will send a jog abort command, and that stops the motion. Uh, you will find in the motion component a second set of help pins related to motion, and that is the so-called hand wheel support or wheel support. That is also a form of jogging, but it is handled internal in the motion component. Um, it is handy to have, it's not very well integrated, and it does not support uh, coordinated mode jogging, or teleop jogging as it's called. So that was joint mode, um, uh, jogging in joint mode. Um, the one which, the mode which we're in, in a motion component, when we're executing G-code, uh, is called coordinated mode. That is the mode where the trajectory planner, uh, the Cartesian trajectory planner, which we just referred to, 
uh, is active and kinematics are applied at the output stage before it hits hell. So that is where the motion pipeline is in place which transforms a Cartesian pass into a series of joint mode, uh, uh, movements. Uh, notice it's either or, uh, joint or coordinated mode. Uh, unfortunately, it is impossible to switch uh, without major destruction. <laughs> uh, in particular, um, you cannot pause a coordinated mo move and jog around uh, some joint and then return to the coordinated move. We'll cover that shortly. Um, so, just to summarize, coordinated mode, mode is the most interesting one. Uh, it's driven by world or Cartesian coordinate targets, uh, by the Canon pipeline, by line segments, by RX and splines. Then in the code, you find a third mode, which I frankly never fully understood why it's there in the first place. Uh, it's essentially is a mode, it's coordinated mode, but other than chord mode, it's for jogging. Now, what's the difference between executing a program and jogging uh, in chord mode? Well, it's a, other for, a different form of input. So, in, in my, as far as I'm concerned, that wouldn't warrant uh, all that uh, draping a different mode around it, but frankly, that's what there is in place. So, uh, now switching between modes is, an imp is important to understand because um, if you configure a machine and, and operate upon it, you will be bitten by the limitations that has in the, in the motion component. I'll just refer to it, just to summarize, um, uh, you have user interface buttons like manual, auto, MDI, and strangely enough, those correspond to modes in motion. Not one-to-one, -one, but mostly. The manual mode uh, correlates to the joint mode in the, of the motion component, whereas auto or MDI um, corresponds to coordinated mode. Uh, barely any configuration uses teleop jogging. Um, as of now, although it would be possible. Um, so, yeah, but in, so in summary, you have this correspondence of auto and MDI with chord mode and manual correspondence with joint mode. Um, now, if you hit the buttons, you switch between modes, and that goes all the way down through um, you from UI to task uh, to the motion component and, and, uh, and flip that mode. Uh, value in, in the motion component. Now, it's not always possible to do that if you've programmed the motion component or through the, the task uh, Python API, for instance, you, you might have found that sometimes it just refuses to switch, switch modes because some certain precondition is not fulfilled. Um, so, the bad news here is that mode switching uh, is somewhat, in, well, pretty inflexible, to be honest. Um, switching from coordinated mode to joint or jogging mode, that is always possible. That's the good news. The bad news is um, um, uh, it will abort the motion queue. That is, if you have an interpreter running um, and uh, uh, you switch to uh, you would switch to joint mode, then you kill the interpreter run, and the rest of the program is flushed. Uh, that's the reason why you can't pause and jog around a little bit. It's that restriction on joint switching, uh, and it has to do with the fact that uh, motion only manages a single single queue. It's a somewhat in inflexible design in that respect. Now, in the other direction, joint to coordinated or teleop mode, um, when you're using, uh, uh, oops, that, that sentence is wrong. In, uh, in, oh, it is right, actually. Uh, when you have trivial kinematics, you can always do that. Um, if it's a non-trivial kinematics, you can only do that switch if the homing sequence has been executed and a reference between uh, machine and uh, uh, 
machine joint positions and the representation in hell has been established. Um, if you want to read up on the background of this uh, mode switching and, and what it entails, I recommend you read that little text fragment, which is tucked away deep in the, in the source directory. And also uh, look at the issue tracker in a, on GitHub and the machine kit uh, repo, uh, which discusses um, possible ideas uh, and ways to reduce the impact of this uh, very intrusive form of mode switching. Um, so uh, that's modes. That's a key concept. And without that, we cannot understand the rest. Uh, I think we've covered, we're through with the rough part now. Um, let's look at the how these modes translates into flows of information through them, um, through the component uh, from from tasks to the pins. We'll first look at the uh, coordinated mode now. That is a somewhat funny picture, and frankly, it is a Ruby Goldberg. I, I feel with you, OK? Uh, and if you're reading the motion component, it is not fun. But um, to get a grasp for the key modes and the flows, and you'll find your way through it eventually. Um, in coordinate mode, we receive uh, 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 pass commands from task, the origin from the interpreter, through MDI or uh, G-code program execution. And uh, that, that interface is actually the only one in the legacy code uh, which um, uh, actually um, enables queued communication between uh, the real-time code and the CNC stack. It's really the only place. Uh, IO control is actually the userland component. It's somewhat similar, but there's no general API for that in the legacy code. We do have one now with the ring buffers and the protobuf messages, but the legacy code does not have that. So this is a custom crafted structure working on shared memory, and it's exceptionally ugly to read. Uh, it will uh, you will need I bleach after that. So, but basically what happens here is C structures are filled in from above and they are pushed down through this, uh, through this command channel. And in the status reporting side, um, there is a structure called mod status. You will find links getting you to the code definition of the key structures and APIs here. Um, Mod status, that is a C structure, which has the key status uh, fields of the motion components, all the joints, the, the pose position, and so forth, and reports that back up level. Up level in that case being um, the, the task uh, coordinator. Um, you re remember from the discussing task, just about everything status in, uh, um, in a running machine key configuration is collected in a, in a structure called EMC stat. It's a core structure. And if you want to understand the code, you should read it. Uh, it is uh, practically impossible to do anything programming without having uh, seen, seen that key structure. So that's the two, that's the command structures, the mod command structure. Uh, feeding commands into the motion component, uh, the status structure coming back out of the motion component, and the whole thing go through a piece of um, a C API uh, called the user mod API, and that uh, the link underneath this text takes you to the to the to the uh, to the glue code, which talks to task on the one side with NML, by the way and to, to motion through shared memory on the other side. Uh, you might have noticed that um, I said C structures. Now, from the discussion last time uh, about NML, you will remember C, uh, NML is a C++-based middleware. Uh, so those are, in principle, not compatible. 
at the language and memory layout level, which is why in this particular piece of glue code, there's a transcoding of NML messages to equivalent C structures and back. So that is also the locus of C++ to C language adaptation, which is one of the reasons why it's a supremely ugly piece of code. Anyway, so that's the feeding side. At the other end uh, is the stuff which you see mostly in the, in the motion man page. So that's the, the set of help pins. You'll find the joint commanded position, velocity pins, following error, uh, a gazillion of status pins. Everything which uh, drives uh, a machine eventually. Uh, that API here, that help, that help pin uh, um, layer is at the joint level, and it really is at the level of a commanded position, a commanded velocity, and a reported position. It does not go any further down than that, because for that we have drivers like steppers, we have server loops. So that is actually quite quite a good delineation at the at the, um, the helping level of the the commanded uh, position and commanded velocity. So uh, and the rest of it translates between those two. So uh, quite a job. Now uh, in the case of coordinated moves, um, oh let me stack back uh, back a second first. Uh, you will find that the motion component has actually two thread functions, one called command handler or some such, and the other one control, uh, motion control or some such. And you need to add both uh, to a real-time thread uh, in sequence to, uh, uh, for the configuration to work. Now, um, this relates to two part. These two thread functions relate to two uh, pieces in the code, uh, which might at have, have at some point meant to be the right part being real time and that one being non real time. Um, the way it is now, both live in the real time space, uh, but the fact is most of that stuff in the command handler. Um, the upper half of motion, as I call it, um, actually would not need to have that. It is a limitation of the design, uh, which came back from, from kernel thread modules, uh, kernel thread systems, that this is actually an RT. It need not be. However, uh, it has um, found its way there, and through long patching and modification, um, um, Certain coding practices have appeared in this in this code base, which make it very hard to separate them again. Okay, even if that were a desirable state of affairs. Fact is, programming in the real time environment is a very restricted affair. It's C only. You don't have any scripting languages available. Uh, none of the nice library support. Um, it's very limited. So, what one really would like to do is have the command have like in user land and uh, only have that strange real time to user land boundary down here. Uh, but the way the, the code is written, that seems to be um, next to impossible, except for a few corners, uh, which I'm going to refer to later on. Uh, also, in the, in the venerable tradition of writing components, there is a huge blob of shared state between those two. Um, thread functions, uh, and there is no coordination mechanism in place, like um, use of atomic variables, ring buffers, uh, uh, double buffers, triple buffers, or anything that would you would use for inter-thread communication. The whole thing is coded as a single-threaded uh, list of functions to be called in turn. First command, then control, and by the way, at the same rate thousand times a second. Uh, and if you don't do that, if you put them into separate threads, then at some point you will violate assumptions uh, about uh, coordination of this shared state. So frankly, that 
that would be nice to have, but that's uh, that's not in place. So summer, we summarize. There is a command handler, and as a control uh, part of the motion component, which relates to um, um, uh, play, to accepting commands from user land and doing the right thing. For instance, filling parameters into shared state as they come down for motion. Parameterizing the motion component, like setting velocity, setting acceleration, setting limits, that's all done through commands. So these commands come in here, and these limits wind up in shared state. Okay. So the command handler pretty much listens up here and does the right thing, fill in parameters. But uh, also, if, for instance, coordinated move commands come in, like a line, an arc, a nerves, what then happens is that line segment is passed to a separate component, the trajectory planner. We'll look a little bit into the API in a subsequent slide here. That is really an API here. Um, because that on the trajectory planner is actually in a separate component. It's not in a motion component proper anymore. So if a line comes in here, um, that that command handler code calls upon a trajectory planner um, API and enqueues a line move in the in the what's called the planner queue. So conceptually, that code and that planner queue are one piece. Okay, it just if you if you're a C++ type. The planner queue is part of the instance data of that component. Uh, so a line would be, through calling upon the trajectory planning API, enqueued here in this planner queue. And that's pretty much it for the, uh, for the up, as far as the upper half of the, um, uh, of the motion component, the command handler is concerned. Um, the interesting part actually happens in the lower half. Um, now, and that's where um, in coordinated mo mode, commands are taken from the planner queue and actually transformed into joint samples or access samples, sorry to say, in, in, since we're working in Cartesian space. that uh, and. That is essentially the playout stage of the tractor planner. It calls upon the tractor planner API to move time up to the next sample, get me the position where I should be now, and then it feeds the resulting pose. The result is a pose. It's in Cartesian space. It feeds that to the inverse kinematics. We remember that transforms the, the Cartesian to the joint space, and bang, the output uh, of the inverse kinematics is applied to the help pins, and that eventually drives uh, the, the motors, the joints. So that's roughly the fl flow. Uh, a line comes in, uh, it's handled by the command handler. Oh, I see, I've seen a line. I'll call upon the director planner API which enqueues a, a, a line segment um, or an arc segment. That, could, uh, that queue is a couple of hundred or thousand uh, uh, entries big. Um, and that's where the task completes. And the lower half actually dequeues from that, uh, uh, that planner queue in isochronous spaced samples. Um, there is a key function there called TP run cycle, which will we, we'll come to that, and that actually does all the planning uh, and um, um, the, the trajectory uh, planner operations. I'm weaseling a little bit about the internals of the trajectory planner. Uh, I like the API. I, I understand it enough to use it. I do not understand the internals. Please don't hold my toes to the fire on this one. Uh, but that is the basic uh, mode of operation. You parameterize it. You instantiate it with a queue. You parameterize it. You add line segments. And in a real-time space, you pull out samples. You get the next position with TP run cycle. 
you get the position which was just computed, you feed it through the in a, uh, kinematics transform, you apply it to the pins, and bang, the motors move. Okay? So uh, this might not be a particularly elegant way of moving samples th through the component, but uh, if you read the component, it's not elegant either. So that picture matches the coding style, if you will. Uh, it's important that, uh, to understand that uh, there are two paths here. So far, we only addressed the command paths as things are passed down through the motion pipeline. But of course, there is a pass backwards as well, and namely from where the machine is currently at. Um, and that is typically joint positions, which come in through uh, the HAL drivers or whatever HAL setup you have there, whether it's the actual value of an encoder or the position uh, of a step again generator. So there's an actual position coming back. And by the way, if those fall apart too much, that means that the machine is unable to track whatever the track to planner has been feeding to the, to the pins. And that typically causes a, uh, a following error. Uh, if, that, uh, if the commanded and the actual uh, joint positions fall apart beyond uh, the following error limit. So let's li look at the pass backwards. The pass backwards coming from hell is in joint space. So um, now in the UI space and in the planning land, in task and the UI, we work in Cartesian space. And frankly, many UIs don't even know whatever, whatever the kinematics is. So um, uh, a UI cannot be bothered with, with the concept of joints and, and, and kinematics. You want to have positions reported <coughs> I'm sorry, um, positions reported in Cartesian space. So in here comes joint coordinates, joint positions. A reporting requirement up here is a Cartesian space. So we need to do the inverse transform here. And that's where the forward kinematics function kicks in. Um, those joint values are fed through the forward kinematics function. And that winds up in the internal status which is essentially eventually fed back through EMC mod status up, up, the, up, the, up the pipeline to task and eventually to the UI. It, all that winds up in the EMC stat structure. So the second pass, joint positions come into pins. Uh, they're translated through the forward kinematics into Cartesian positions, and back they go into task and the UI. Okay. So that was the complicated part. Um, well, of course, it's much more complicated than that because I'm skipping a lot of detail. But coordinate mode is more involved. Um, in joint mode, things are a lot simpler. I mean, all caps, lot. Um, essentially, in joint mode, commands are fed through from task pretty much directly uh, as target positions on the joint level in the shared state. And they become a target, uh, a position target, of what's called the joint planner. That is a per axis um, instance of code uh, which moves a simple, single joint. It is, by the way, disjoint from the trajectory planner code. Uh, if you ask me why that is the case, I have no answer. Uh, why there are multiple planners? In my view, there is no good reason. Uh, there's probably no good. Um, um, there, there's no good reason to have different planners, really. But anyway, the joint planner is actually quite simple. Uh, I've um, down here um, is a link in the second line in the text block below. Um, um, there's a, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, source EMC motion directory is a short code fragment called simple underscore TP, a header file and a C file. And uh, actually, I have a suggested, have, you might want to have a look at it. That is pretty much the excerpted out code of the joint planner in, in the motion component. And it's actually 
quite simple to read. It's just maybe 100 lines or so. But it gets you the key concepts of joint planning, namely applying a maximum velocity, applying a maximum speed, um, and reaching a target position under these constraints, like ramping up the velocity under acceleration constraints, doing the cruise phase, uh, doing the deceleration phase, and uh, coming to a stop. Yeah? It's quite an interesting uh, piece of code because it, it's easy to understand, uh, isolated. You can find pretty much the same code, code sequence in the promotion component, but it's next to unreadable in the way it's embedded. Um, I have actually reworked this simple planner into a standalone health component, and I'm going to show you this um, uh, as it runs in hell. I need to switch screens now. Uh, to show you that component, oops, uh, screen share, that would be it. Um, um, that is the joint planner component uh, in action as a health scope um, um, plot. Let me stop that, that's a, lo a little bit nervous. So. Um, uh, it's a demo setup, and you can find it in the link which I gave uh, uh, on the last slide at the bottom. Um, it's a, a quite good explanation of the, the concept of joint planning and how you feed Qt commands to a, uh, a planner. And actually, it might have uses beyond that. So uh, uh, you, you might be able to use that in, in other configurations as well. OK, let me get back to my slides. So uh, that's what you just saw. The reworked, uh, uh, reworking that simple TP code into a standalone planner, uh, which can actually do several joints in parallel. Um, so that is the flow of information um, and execution when you do jogging. Yeah? Something very similar happens through uh, when homing as well, by the way. Homing is a glorified joint jogging uh, mechanism. So that's the two key modes. We'll skip teleop mode because, for all intents and purposes, it's close enough to the uh, to the motion component to the coordinated mode. Um, so uh, we'll turn to the APIs. Um, already mentioned command feeding um, of the motion component. So up from task come C structures. I mentioned that. These structures have a type field. And here are a couple of example types. They're not surprising, enabling, disabling. But of course, it's the mode switching commands. It is actually sending line, arc, and NURB segments, uh, sending commands like probe, and so forth. Also stuff like a command serial and parameters like velocity, acceleration, target position, and so forth. So that is the command channel. Um, the status updates, uh, again, you have find a link uh, here uh, uh, which takes you to the GitHub repo for the definition of that structure. Um, that's, what, that's the part of the shared state in motion which is fed back upstream. It's just a subset. It's not all of it. Uh, and um, it contains all the Cartesian and per joint status and data pertaining to the execution of the current command. For instance, the serial number and whether the, the, the command actually executed correctly or there was an error, or if it is still pending with R RCS exec. Now, in theory, that would be quite a versatile API uh, for other purposes. Uh, fact is, nobody ever wrapped that into a generally usable C or Python API. The only component in the whole stack which uses that is the task. That's the only piece of code which directly talk, talks to motion. Um, fact is also that um, the motion components design predates the concept of hell. That came a couple of years later. So status was there already, and then hell pins came. And uh, the consequence was that it wasn't that 
the status pins, the status elements were translated into help pins, but much of the status was duplicated into help pins. So you have the motion component has a lot of copying back and forth between pins and status elements. Um, keep that in mind when you try to read the code. So that's the command feeding and status reporting API, which is only used by task. Um, C-level structures passed back and forth through shared memory. No surprises here. Uh, now, um, the one, one of the few pieces of code which I actually recommend in motion, uh, because it is reusable and it's quite well designed, is the Track Day Planner interface or API. Uh, again, you'll find a link here. Um, it's very well abstracted. It's quite well documented in the code, not, not in the manual. And uh, by the way, uh, you probably remember Rob Ellenberg has done a great job on improving it, especially with lip uh, blending and look at for improved performance. Uh, it is, we already talked through that two levels uh, of APIs. In queuing segments, uh, including line, in queuing lines, arcs, and so forth, uh, from the up from the command side, and on the lower level, dequeuing and sending to motion. Now that's where we just have a very coarse look at the API. Of course, that uh, that is a class that needs to be initialized. So there's a function called tp init. I'm I'm skipping the details of parameter passing here. I'm just showing on a sketch what would be needed to execute the line through it. Uh, you would have to initialize it. You have to. You would have to parameterize it for maximum values for the cycle period and so forth. And once you have done that, you would be able to add line segments or circle uh, or arcs uh, to the trajectory planner queue. Uh, by the way, the end, of course, here is in uh, in Cartesian space, and you give it desired velocity. So that's the, the the wish, the velocity you wish for. So that that is uh, in a nutshell how you would talk to it from the upper side. Um, that's hidden in the command handler part in the command dot c in the motion directory. Um, and at the lower level, um, that is the point. That is the the bona fide real time part of motion. Uh, Control dot C. Uh, I already referred to that. What happens there is uh, it calls upon um, a, f a method called run cycle, which does the computation for the next control point, and then it retrieves that. That does all the magic. And TP get pose then retrieves the resulting pose of that operation. Now again, pose is Cartesian, which is why before we go towards joints, we need to imply the inverse kinematics. And seems like a beam, we get the result, the joint uh, values as a result of that operation. And the last thing left here is actually copy these uh, joint, the variables in this joint array into the corresponding help pins. And that, com that sequence is at the core of the, the motion cycle computation. There are about 30-ish or so uh, methods. I'm just talk uh, touching two or three key ones. TP abort, while well, that uh, stops motion as soon as it can. If you hit escape, that's what's called in the trajectory planner in coordinated mode. Uh, but also, if you do a probing operation, uh, that's also a, a TP, uh, TP add line. And once the, the probe switch closes, then TP abort is called, and we record, we record the position where we stopped. So uh, probing also interfaces to that. Uh, also, the, the pausing and resume function um, uh, are to actually plenty APIs. Um, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to make those slides full screen. Uh, we see the faces of the Hangout session. Uh, and that, uh, 
why do uh, I wish I could do that? Uh, let me try for a moment. Mm. I'm not very. Oh, huh. I'm sorry, but I'm I'm not proficient enough in Google in Google Hangout for 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 this to work. Uh, it it might be that the font now turns out a little bit smallish, so you might have to read up the slides on the side. Okay, I'm past one minute past nine, so I better hurry up. Um, pause and resume are the functions where are which are behind the pause button. Um, well, um, I frankly do not know on how to remove the faces in my broadcast. Screen share, uh, present to everyone. Does th the, did this do it? Do you still see the faces? Okay, now. Oh, super. Okay. Uh, Sorry, I forgot to push a button here. Um, excellent. So, um, if there is any reading of the motion component, I actually would um, uh, suggest you follow the link which I have given the, the uh, here at the bottom. Um, that is actually what makes the joints move, and we might actually move to that link. Uh, and look at the code example. Oh, darn. Ah, um, I'm just seeing that link it has the wrong value. So let me uh, uh, let me find that piece of code. Um, so I can. These are these are really key for uh, for for the lines of code uh, which you should have seen once. It is in the control.c file, and we're almost there. I'm searching for the code location. EP run cycle. Okay, got it. Um, uh, I'm just highlighting it, and here we go. Okay, let me switch the screen to this piece of code uh, and present to everyone. That should be it. Uh, you will find this in uh, in EMC Motion Control C around line six, uh, fourteen sixty. That is the piece of code which is executed once per every motion cycle, and that is the lower half, the, the, the dequeuing operation, where the next point from the tractor planner is pulled and pushed towards the motion pins. I'm skipping the outer loop here for the moment. Um, you'll see one call here, that is the run cycle uh, method, which uh, gets the next point of the Cartesian planning uh, planner. And um, the result of that call is actually remains within the state of the planner. Uh, you can retrieve it by the subsequent call to get pause. So that is, if you will, mod Q is the instance parameter. There can be several instances of planners if you would want to. And that's where the Cartesian position land winds up with. That is an EMC pose. Uh, that's where the the, uh, the pose is converted to joint positions. And um, now to understand the cubic next point and cubic add point, um, well, I'll defer to the next slides. Well, I'll skip to that um, because that needs to understand the interpolation mode first. But you will see the the the. The output of that is the, posi the commanded position and the commanded velocity. And the, the velocity being the difference to the, the commanded position uh, at, the, uh, at the last cycle. And 
when, when a segment is done, it sets a flag. So that is the key piece of code which drives out um, code mode uh, pass to joint pins. Uh, let me return back to the APIs. Um, um, I think I will be quite done quite quickly, or so I hope. Present to everyone. So that was a minimum overflight of the Tractor Planner API. Uh, kinematics, I'm going to speed up because I'm six minutes behind. Um, it's a very simple API. Kinematics are modules which can be loaded at runtime. Uh, it's essentially just two functions, the forward and the inverse transform, and a flag word which tells it uh, uh, which ones are available. I'm not going into the details uh, on that right now. That's um, uh, not not relevant. That relevant at the moment. Again, faces in front. Okay. Okay. I hope the faces are gone. Um, and let me pick the the reporting window so so I can see have an eye on the chat. So kinematics is really just a Per machine, uh, per ARM configuration module, which provides those two functions. And the motion component just blindly calls upon it. Um, so there's nothing particularly special here. You find the kinematics definitions for a whole ser range of um, kinematics in the source EMC kinematics directory. Um, nothing magic here, except that nobody in user land actually uses them. Um, uh, the last point I'm going to address is the interpolator. When we discussed this piece of code, you, you saw that I skimped a question on interpolation here. Um, what the interpolator stage, it's the last stage in the, in the motion pipeline, actually is supposed to do is to smooth a trajectory. Okay? So you would have the control points here, and as the motion moves between the control points, uh, interpolation would create something like a smooth curve, so it's non jerky, non, not edgy, um, less load on the machine, uh, less wear, and so forth. Well, that of course assumes that there, there's more than one sample between each control point. Uh, that used to be the case in the past, uh, uh, I mean, at least 10 years back, uh, uh, I'd say, uh, the, the, the distance of trajectory uh, control points was much larger than the actual motion control cycle, like a factor of five. So that that is called the trajectory rate, and you still find it in the configuration values. Uh, but it has since been set to be identical to the motion rate, to the playout rate. So what we actually have, uh, the cubic interpolator is still in place, but it has nothing to smooth for because the input rate and the output rate are identical. So it has no net effect. Uh, it just um, needs four samples, uh, position samples to work with and it is responsible for a, sm a, sm a small delay. So again, that is the piece of, uh, play, uh, piece of code uh, where that, where that is, is actually used. It's quite an elegant piece of code. It might be reusable for other projects. The way it's currently in the motion component, it's actually spreading more confusion than it does because it adds no value. The last subject I'm going to touch upon uh, is homing. Uh, not because I'm, um, it is particularly complex in uh, conceptually, but it is a huge piece of code in the motion component. Um, we touched upon it when we need it, when we have no absolute position feedback, so we need to establish that reference at startup. Uh, homing uh, is, co the manual section is quite, quite detailed, there is a, a lot of different sequences possible. And how you can do homing, you can join home joints sequentially. You can home them in parallel. Uh, 
that's all noise. At the core of it, you have a joint move and a probing operation, uh, which watches for a switch being closed, and everything goes from there. So that is essentially a joint mode, a joint uh, move operation. Um, on top of that, if there's an AB encoder uh, um, connected to an axis, um, what it can do is trigger on the index pin of that encoder for added uh, accuracy of the of the homing position. Um, so that's specific to encoder positions, of course. Now. Um, it is actually quite a complex piece of code. You find here links. It has it's a state machine with 25 states. Uh, it fills a whole page. It's uh, uh, almost a thousand lines of code, and it's immutable. It's ingrained in C. Uh, if I were to do it, I would do that in Python. Find a way to f to interact uh, uh, with a, a, a minimum RT part uh, to do that and do all that in scripting operation, but that's the way it is. Uh, it's ingrained in the, in the motion component. So uh, we're 12 minutes behind. Uh, I'm already at the last slide. Um, that was a very minimal overview of the joint and, and chord mode operations and, and, and what motion does and what the key flows are. Now. Uh, as you've seen from some of the, the pictures and my explanations, that is horribly complex and it is huge. Uh, a, com a complete walkthrough is um, would would take days, if uh, if if not more than than a week. Um, it is supremely complex uh, because of all the different functionality which has been crammed in. It is really the only co uh, uh, component which does talk a queued interface, because there, there was no abstraction for a queued API between RT and non-RT in the legacy code base. We do have that now with ring buffers. That's all easier now, but uh, that's where it stands. So because it had this special crafted interface, uh, all the queued operations were rammed down that pipeline. So just to avoid to invent yet another uh, um, a communication channel instead of abstracting it out and making it generally available as as an API, as general API. Frankly, uh, structure it, it works. It works with a CNC stack. As I mentioned, it has no general scripted API. Uh, it might be doable. It is quite specific. Um, it might be an interesting project, by the way, to have a Python API to the uh, to the motion component. Um, but structurally, uh, the way it's written with this huge shared state blob, uh, I think um, working out on it incrementally uh, is almost impossible. And Yixin Li probably uh, needs to, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a backtrace here in the events channel. Hello. Um, uh, uh, Yixing Li has been putting a work, uh, a, a, a work, uh, a lot of work into uh, making motion work in new environments. Might uh, would be interesting to have a talk come from him at that, at that space. And I guess he found it very difficult as well. So, way too much stuff done in RT code. Way too much than stuff, stuff done in C. Much of that could actually be in user land in a Python uh, script. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that is a little bit hard because, uh, or to be honest, frankly unfeasible, because uh, of that shared state and lack of synchronization between the upper and lower half. Uh, we would have to do a similar process like, like I have done in the Hell multi-core branch with a um, uh, with an encoder and stepper components to disentangle these shared state blobs into per thread function blobs, and to make sure the synchronization between those is clean and multi-thread safe. Um, the design as it stands is single-threaded, so the hopes are not very high to do that. So 
it, my take on uh, improving the motion component as it stands is very rough, okay? But, and that's a course of action which I recommend if you're interested in motion control and uh, in the space in general, um, it is very much possible to salvage parts. In particular, the, the trajectory planner, the kinematics, and the interpolator code have rather clean APIs, and they're relatively simple to understand. If you go for the whole motion component, that is uh, an uphill battle. Those parts are understandable, and they have clean APIs, so they can be factored out. They can be wrapped into either RT components or actually user land code, because uh, directory planning um, does not necessarily have to be uh, in, in RT. Only the playout part, which is very small, uh, needs to be in RT. For that to happen, um, there's that, that is an advanced programming operation. Again, the trajectory planner is not multi-thread safe in the sense that you could call different methods from different threads at the same time. But um, the locus of where that needs to happen is actually a very small piece of code. It's just the TP run cycle, the TP get pause, the avoid code, pause and resume. It's a very few methods, so I think it's actually possible to do that. Um, to give you an idea, for the stepper component, it took me about a week to do that. Uh, and my guess for the for the trajectory planner, it's round about the same ballpark. Um, it is uh, also possible to skimp that horrible EMC uh, uh, mod interface code, special purpose code. Um, and that was one of the reasons why I, I created this joint planner component, also as an example on how you could, how you would do something like motion if you started today. So if you're interested in that component, and that was the health scope picture which you saw just before, um, then um, uh, just follow that link, build that branch, and uh, and read the code. It's about 200 lines or so, and it should give you a reasonable idea on, on how that um, uh, how you would structure that. It's an uh, I think it's an interesting read. Anyway, 22:18. I'm 18 minutes past. I got a little bit better, but um, it's not perfect yet. Uh, I'm stopping the presentation now and. I'm happy to take any questions, right? Let me turn to the event channel. Okay, we have a, a stack break trace here. I don't think that was a question on the talk. Um, is there anything specifically I can clarify or focus on? And please excuse me if I take a sip of wine at that point. Any questions so far? Let's see if Michael has come up with anything. Uh, nope. I hear. Um, I understand everybody. Uh, it was so impressed that um, no questions remained, which is, um, uh, <laughs> well, thanks anyway. Um, well, then, uh, then let me conclude the presentation here. Um, I'm, I'll be around at the event channel for some time. Uh, we can follow up uh, at the mailing list if you want to. Um, um, uh, and, uh, and clarify any open questions which remain from that. Anyway, I hope that that will be the foundation for Rob's Ellenberg's talk, Ellenberg's talk on the trajectory planner internals, um, uh, which we haven't set a date yet. It might be uh, uh, a bit of time because until that happens, I will be away over the next six weeks or so. Um, I received um, new hardware, but it's not machining hardware. It is this, and it's an oxygen vent because I'm going high altitude uh, 
hot air ballooning, and I'll be away for a couple of weeks. So bear with me. But we'll be back, uh, and eventually Rob do, will do the hard part on the trajectory planner. Have a good, good evening from, from Gantz, and uh, see you on the list.